introduced in 2021 is to levy, by the way, national health insurance was 2012, uh, the, 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 the education trust was 20, 2000. Then you have COVID-19, and its purpose was a levy for the supply of goods and services and imports of goods and services into Ghana to raise revenue to support COVID-19 expenditures and related matters. I'm still not sure exactly what those expenditures and related matters are. But everything you buy, you are paying 1% as a citizen. That's the burden you pay. Four, electronic transfer levy. I will return to this particular subject. Now... We all know what it means. There was too many debate about, too, I mean, debates about it, and I wouldn't touch on it anymore, except when I return to it for what I think we could have used it for. Africa Union import levy, 0 0.2. ECOWAS levy, Africa Union import levy was 2017. ECOWAS levy, 2003, 0 0.5. Energy fund levy, and I have to talk about that. It's one Ghana peso on petrol and kerosene and diesel since 2015. The energy sector owes more than it owed before this fund was introduced. It's very clear. Now, these are the powers given by citizens to managers of the economy to make their life better. And citizens are being asked to pay this. Sanitation and pollution levy, 2021. Its purpose was to levy to help, uh, help address sanitation issues in the country. 10 Ghana pesos per liter of petroleum. I'm not so sure whether sanitation issues have been resolved on your way here. But we are being levied for that. And I bet that if we were to speak to the, those in charge of sanitation, what they would tell you is that their problem is lack of funding. Then we have energy sector levy, which has become ESLA. 20 pesos per liter on petrol and diesel, 18 pesos on LPG, 2021 as revised to pay the capacity charge on the energy sector and its bills used by power plants to generate energy. Now, I know that has been removed on industry, but that the industry's cost uh, of power is still very high based on its products on competitive. Again, the problem is still there. National Fiscal Stabilization Levy 2013 to levy taxes that are imposed on companies and institutions for fiscal stabili stabilization. Is our fiscal regime stable? You all know the answer. It definitely is not stable. Tourism levy, to provide funding for tourism and tourism-related activities. 1% payable by a person of a tourism enterprise and specified under the Act. So when you go to a restaurant, our tourism is anything, I mean, I hope you know <laughs> you, you can make the judgment yourself. Real estate levy, let me skip it, so everybody pays it. Energy debt recovery. Now, this energy debt recovery, specifically related to TOR, the Tamawe refinery, one, the, the managers of the state messed up TOR, so to speak, and passed on the burden to us. And to this date, the TOR debt is still there, to the best of my knowledge. Road fund levy. It started, I think, initially at 10 pesos, went to 40, now 48 pesos. And it is support road maintenance. Again, you have the answer, whether the roads are being maintained. Stabilization recovery fund, financial sector recovery, national electrification scheme levy, public lighting levy, export Improvement levy that is supposed to go to the Exim Bank and levy on all imports and goods and proceeds for the Ghana Exim Bank so it to promote export. Again, you are the judges yourself, and the response from the room tells me what you feel about this. Then there is advanced eco levy. Let me skip it. The point is, it sounds as if that Ghanaians have no right to earn net income or disposable income. And at any time we seem to be improving our income, we must be levied with something that will enable us to take the levy and take the money and give it to persons that we kill to elect every four years so that they will make our lives better and they end up making our lives worse. Now, individual corporate and corporate citizens cannot be said to be prospering if every money that they get is taken away from them. My first recommendation, Mr. Chairman, 
is that we ought to be thinking of an upper limit beyond which governments cannot tax us, imposing it by law, that there must be an upper limit beyond which government cannot impose taxes. And now that I did hear that the, the, now that we, we do have the situation where a private member bill can be introduced, I would recommend to our parliamentarians that this is one area they need to be looking at, that there should be a limit as to the ability of government to levy taxes on us. Otherwise, they will continue increasing their expenditure and indirectly pass on the expenditure to the citizenry who voted them. The worst is that, to the best of my knowledge, none of these levies, absolutely none, has achieved this purpose. So we collect the money, it doesn't achieve its purpose, and we add more. Particular reference will be made to the road fund and the toll recovery fund, both of which were expected to eradicate the problem once and for all. You know the answer. Now, <clears throat> the idea about limiting the government's borrowing, sorry, taxes on us, should also come with another idea of limiting the government's ability to borrow. Because how are these expenditures made? They are made by the government either borrowing externally or borrowing from our local market bonds or T-bills to fund these expenditures. And they end up passing it on to us. Again, I think it is important that we limit the government's ability to borrow. If we do not pass a legislative instrument, a legislative a, a, a framework to limit the ability to borrow, this problem will not be solved. And there's a reason why I believe so strongly. It is because we live in a society whose culture worships authority and is quite permissive in its attitude. That's a subject I will return to. You cannot divorce culture from constitution. It's very important. The constitution is the supreme law of the land, but culture trances constitution. I want to repeat that. Constitution is the supreme law of the land, but culture trances constitution. I am not a supporter of those who actually keep arguing that everything in the constitution should be turned upside down. Strangely enough, much as I'm criticizing these things, I don't believe that the constitution should be amended completely. And when I do the score on what the constitution itself gets, I give the constitution itself a very high mark. My problem is that the culture of the people who use the constitution is such that they find any way to abuse. Now, there is no law in the world, absolutely no law, including the constitution, which is so good enough to prevent evil-minded people from doing that which is wrong. And there is no law in the world so bad which will prevent a good man from doing that which is right. We have to understand that. No matter how good the law is, if you intend to abuse it, you will abuse it. Our constitution is very clear that cabinet should be 8, 19 maximum. But we have found a nice way of distinguishing cabinet from ministers. If we have our mind to do the right thing, the constitution doesn't really matter. We will find a way around it. So no law will limit people who have evil minds from doing that which is wrong. And no law will be so good as to prevent a person who has good intentions from doing that which is right. And that is the reason why I am not a wholesale supporter of amending everything in the constitution, much as I critique it. We must separate the spirit and letter from the users. And that is the reason why I focus on the culture of the people. If you have a culture which is permissive, which carry, unfortunately, I have to, I have to say this about chiefs, a culture of a people who carry chiefs whose forefathers sold them into slavery in Palanquin, that culture of a people are so permissive, right, that it is easy for them to worship politicians much as they worship chiefs. And that culture needs to be related to the constitution because it creates an ecosystem of a contest within which we operate. Also, another thing that is worth considering is those who are actors in this space, especially lawyers, ought to be looking more at how to get interpretations in the Supreme Court on the Constitution regarding whether taxation amounts to an infringement of our economic rights, which are infringed in the Constitution. And I actually think so. I think it does. And I will show that shortly. Right. The Constitution assures us of fundamental human rights and protects us from slavery and forced labor. But the point is, if we tax the people so that enterprises are no more growing, we are indirectly breaching the economic rights of the people and their ability to work because enterprises are closing down and enterprises cannot expand. I have argued that we need, and that's perhaps my second recommendation, 
a discriminatory tax system. And that discriminatory tax system is a corporate tax system which rewards persons who, one, in a specified year, maintain the same number of staff, or two, increase the number of staff. Let me explain. If I have 50 employees, and by the end of the year, I have maintained the same number of employees or added more, I ought to pay less corporate tax than a person who had a lesser number. And therefore, we all should not be paying 25% corporate tax. It should be discriminatory so as to encourage people to employ. That's one way to solve the employment problem, not to get people to queue at LWAC with the hope that they will find employment. Public sector doesn't create employment. It doesn't. Unless the public sector operates with a private sector mindset, like China has done. Has done. So it's important that a mere provision against slavery and forced labor is not made to assume that liberty will necessarily allow prosperity and economic growth. It doesn't. You can be liberal, you can be have the, the liberty, and nevertheless be suffering. Protection from deprivation of pro property, Article 20, that deals with how our property should not be taken from us. To the best of my knowledge, a large part of the thinking when it comes to this article appears as if it relates only to real estate and to landed property. I hold the view that assets and property has broad definition and that if I have a bond and I expect interest on the bond, depriving me of the interest for another one year amounts to a deprivation of property. As to whether you can prove that in the Supreme Court or not, it's a totally separate matter. But that is my view, and I cannot be prevented from holding a view. One good thing about America is that they interpret their constitution very broadly, including holding a gun is amounting to freedom of speech. And we need to be testing some of these things. Otherwise, the managers of the economy take any decision and we'll get away with it because we cannot define it in the Constitution. And by the way, I'll be returning to haircut. Haircut is not only an MPP uh, uh, phenomenon, and I will show that shortly. Right. The Constitution's grand grant of freedom to us, in my view, must also include the right to have access to modern socioeconomic facilities. What is the purpose of a, a, a right and a Constitution if people cannot access socioeconomic facilities. Now, you cannot access socioeconomic facilities where many of you or many of us don't have bank accounts, simple bank accounts. A lot of us are so-called unbanked. And for this unbanked category, many people have gone to school writing PhDs on the so-called how to bank the unbanked. Yeah, I can count about five friends I know who have written theses on this. It still remains. Yet in this country, we vote every time and we get voters' ID. 16 million people are on the voters' roll at my last check. But less than 5 million people have bank accounts in the whole nation, if my, my figure is right. Yeah, I think it's less than 5 million. Five, four. A nation where more people who are 18 and above can vote, and there are 16 million, and only 4 million have bank accounts, needs to examine his conscience. The leaders of the society need to examine their conscience. They have to wake up at 2 a.m. and think because it appears we stopped thinking long ago. Now, what is different from converting voters' ID into an automatic bank account with a zero account? That is what Mauritius does. Your birth registration gives you your bank account. It doesn't require magic. There's nothing scientific about it. It can be done almost instantly, just at the hospitals or at the polling station. And this is neither MPP or NDC I mean, uh, uh, how do you call it? It doesn't favor any of them. It gives them the chance to actually collect more taxes from us. Now, on, 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 uh, instead of doing that, we have rather done things which are actually, in my view, very detrimental to the very banking sector in which we want confidence. Our Bank of Ghana, and I'll touch on Bank of Ghana also shortly, talks about the need to increase savings culture. I have my own theory about savings culture, but that is for another day. But you can't increase savings culture by destroying confidence in the financial sector. Now, how have we done that? Let's deal first with E-Levy before I return to the other aspects. Since you had so many people beginning to use Momo, 
I would have thought one of the fastest ways to bring the unbanked into the banking system was to have asked the banks to turn every single mobile account into a bank account automatically. Your telephone number becomes your bank account. After all, that telephone number has a national ID supporting it. And you have registered. Again, overnight, excluding registration of voter ID cards or, 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 or whatever, we could have had bank accounts and increase the number of bank accounts to close the 16. With that bank accounts, you then make sure that every momo is indexed to a bank account. I will not have done the levy. I will tell you what I will have done. And if the authorities want to take this recommendation, they may. In Ghana, they don't speak to you until you wear NDC or MPP t shirt It is not because some of us lack ideas. And some of us have put ideas in the public domain which have been bought, including the center of the world. But I will return to that. Having said that, you see, at times I wonder why Christians go to church, especially Christian politicians, and I have seen some sitting in front of me. <laughs> Jesus Christ was told by his disciples that somebody was healing somewhere but was not healing in the name of Christ. And he said, he who is not against us is for us. In Ghana, the politicians have an opposite maximum, yet they go to church. He who is not wearing a t-shirt is against us. They assume that so far as you are not wearing their t-shirt, you are against them and therefore you have no idea whatsoever. And both of them do the same thing. So some people like me both have branded him as belonging to the opposite. Anyway, so the unbanked could have been brought into the banking sector almost instantly, either through Momo or through voter ID. We have not done that. But what have we done to the banking sector? Let's start from the PNDC before the constitution. Under the running regime of PNDC, anybody who had more than 20 CDs had a problem. It sounds ridiculous, but that was it at that time. My father's house was surrounded. If you had 20 CDs, you had a problem. And a lot of people were investigated, etc. Many people kept their money under their beds. Mattresses in those days became the safes. For those of you who don't know, safe, those who sell safes in Ghana, their sales shot up around July to December last year. Many people were keeping money at home and changing dollars and keeping it at home. We almost went back to that. But after the BNDC, during the NDC, something was introduced called the Financial Sector Improvement Program, FinSIP, where the financial sector was to be cleaned once and for all and will not return to debt and, and, and loans which were in default. We went back. The financial sector had challenges so much with the dollar rising that I will never forget Valentine's Day of 2014. Governor Wampa, and I've said this several times, I make no apologies. He issued a letter, which is perhaps the most disastrous letter I have ever seen, attempting to ban the use of foreign exchange. And many people lost a lot of money overnight. A lot of people have forgotten that. It killed confidence in the financial sector. So we started from BNDC, from the 20 cities, uh, in fact, from AFRC, BNDC, FinCIP, Governor Wampa, then we had a banking collapse between 2015 and 2017. Again, confidence in the financial sector went down. Then there was NDC haircut one. I said I was going to return to this haircut. Yes, NDC also did haircut. And they did a haircut for the banking sector only. So banks were negotiated with and they took some haircuts. Then this time we have haircut two and the MPP, which is banks and others. Are we going to have next time a head cut? Uh, it's a haircut, but if you don't take it, you'll be getting to a haircut. Now, is it real? Mark my words. Watch 2027 to 2029. If we continue doing what we are doing, we will be more broke than we are now. Why can I predict that? And for those of you who don't know, I make predictions. And I have a very high sense of accuracy of predictions. I don't make prophecies. I make predictions. I do that every year at an event called Crystal Ball. And I have a very high accuracy rate. Those who attend know that. The history is very clear. Any time you are declared the fastest growing economy, five to seven years, you'll be back to IMF. You can check the records. And I have tweeted about this. I don't blame IMF for that. You will notice that it encourages us to borrow so much and misbehave that we walk to IMF, which is a lender of last resort, to be disciplined. In other words, we admit our indiscipline. So in my view, the economy will stabilize by 2024, 2025, but by 2027, 2029, if we do what we are doing, we will be borrowing much more and we will need more salvation. 
directive principles of state policy. That actually creates objectives under the constitution for each, 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 each citizen to play a role in the economy and for the nation to protect our resources. There has been a whole argument as to whether it is justiciable or otherwise, but now the Supreme Court has settled the matter that it is justiciable. But let's look at how the managers of the economy since the 1992 constitution have dealt with our assets. We sold our shares in Anglo Gold Ashanti entirely. Those shares were appropriated for us by Kutua Champon 55%. We didn't have those shares in the first place. He nationalized it. And after the shares got value, we sold all of it. We sold Ghana Airways, and we sold Ghana Airways at the time we were broke. We sold Ghana Telecom at that time to balance the budget by $150 million only. Now, at the last time I heard, we have 17 more enterprises that we have listed to sell. That was just announced by the Minister for Public Sector Enterprises or something like that. I don't know the list of the enterprises. But the sale is continuing. Now, I'll compare that to China shortly as how we protect enterprises or state resources as against that of other countries. I took a look at the constitution of China, Rwanda, USA, and Singapore as a comparison as to what makes these nations progress. Can anything be tra traced to their constitution and their culture? Now, you will notice that under Chapter 7, the citizens who are complaining about that far are given the right to vote. But it appears the citizens get powerless immediately after they vote. And they have no power. Again, unfortunately, two of my parliamentarian friends are here. I can see them. And I think they are more. Parliament is supposed to be representative of the people. It appears the executive gets its way irrespective of whatever. And please, by the executive, this has existed since 1993. In fact, when we had the 137, 137, many were those who thought, aha, for once. Somebody was going to check the executive. Nothing changed. So clearly, it appears the right to vote is all the right that the citizens have been left with. Nothing more by the way we behave. Now, having said that, we have also turned elections into a very, very expensive enterprise. The slide shows how much we have spent on electoral commission and voting over the period 2000 to 2020. And you can see the increases in numbers, jumping particularly from, look a bit stable from 2000 to 2008, jumped a bit to 2012. 2016 jumped significantly, and 2020 jumped slightly significantly. Now, in all this, we've increased the number of constituencies. We keep increasing them, and that I will touch on also. And the only referenda worth note that I remember is a recent referenda to actually uh, divide the country into more regions, which I will touch on again. We have no Swiss option here. Perhaps we need to be considering a Swiss option. What is Swiss option? In Switzerland, almost everything goes into a referendum. And therefore, the electoral commission, for want of a better word, quote and unquote, is not waiting until four years when the people come to vote and go. Almost every decision. The last time I was in Zurich, the question of whether or not you should increase the minimum wage is by vote. And it's a system is so organized that on your way to work, you vote. By five o'clock, the people decided that minimum wage should not be increased. Finished. In Zurich, the mayor wanted to expand a certain road. There was a referendum. And he decided that the road should remain, that the traffic is OK. <laughs> because you cannot commit public expenditure to that. And these are things we need to learn from. Rwanda has a similar provision, which I will touch on. So we just keep charging the expenses. And the countries we admire, we keep saying, the last I checked is over $200 million we are spending on elections. The countries we admire several times our GDP, which huge foreign reserves, and 3% of global trade, Singapore, is smaller than Accra. They spend only $2.5 million on elections. $2.5 million, simple. That's how much they spend on elections. And for the avoidance of that, Singapore is, a, is a, not a, a communist country or a one party, it's a, it's a multi party country. It is a lot that has to do with our culture. If there is any entity that has benefited from the constitution, it is the political parties. 
they have benefited more than any. They are the biggest beneficiaries. Theoretically, they were supposed to galvanize ideas so that our collective prosperity will be ensured. However, Mr. Chairman, so far as I'm concerned, the political parties have become a duopoly of disunity, leading us to our economic doom by polarizing everything. Chapter 8 of the Constitution creates the office of the president. There's been a lot of debate as to whether the term of office is okay or not, whether it should be prolonged. In fact, one president during his last speech actually said we should prolong or extend the term. I totally disagree. My main concern at this stage, though, has to do with the appointments the president is giving power to give. And if you look at Article 70 and align it with 195, you will see that he has power to keep just appointing and increasing the public sector as much as you can, they can. Added to what I know Professor Abuchi was just talking about on Joy FM on my way here, has to do with bringing bills to parliament. Every bill you bring to parliament has a cost effect. And in Rwanda's constitution, I think Article 89 or so, I have to check, you cannot bring a bill to parliament, Rwanda, without justifying whether the cost that is created is actually being provided for, or whether the bill is intended to reduce the cost. It's a provision in the Rwanda constitution. So you just don't create bills. Here we create bills, and because the executive has its way, we keep adding on to the cost. So there are limits. Indeed, the president and parliament can scratch each other's back and increase their emoluments. We all know that. I don't need to go. Under the constitution of the US, parliament can only increase its salaries and emoluments if it is for the next parliament and not the incumbent parliament. So they have kept their allowances and emoluments very stable because you cannot increase it for the next parliament. So is the president. The president cannot increase his or her emoluments unless it's for the next term. And again, those are things we need to learn from. So my view about whether we should extend the president term or not is very extreme. It's an impractical recommendation. But just to give that impractical recommendation so that we understand that as much as possible, we should stay where we are. My impractical recommendation is that given the chance, our president term should be one year and not more. <laughs> Why do I say this in practical recommendation? It will operate like how Rotary Clubs operate. In the first year, we will elect two presidents, one incumbent and one in waiting. Every year, we go to the referendum and elect another one. So whenever you are incumbent, you know the next person is waiting. It is not long enough for you to finish any project, and therefore you must continue the whole project, and it is not long enough for you to mess up the economy. One year is enough, and they become ceremonial. Is that in practice? Yes, Switzerland has it. It's a committee, and every year, one person takes turn to be president. There was a time of a turn of a president whose wife had had a baby, and he decided that he didn't want to be president that year. It's not, impo it's not possible in Ghana. <laughs> so we should either keep it or reduce it. All right. Having said that, let's deal with cabinet, which I talked about earlier. And I don't want to go into the legalese of minimum of nine, 10 and 19. Those are legal issues that I don't, and I'm a lawyer, I understand them very well. You can manage this country adequately with 15 ministers. 15. I have no doubt about that, and I can prove to anybody that you can. Now, one of the faults of the Constitution is the creation of deputies. It's one of the recommendations in the Constitution, which, as far as I'm concerned, was inserted for Jerry Rollins. And therefore, if you made a comment that Jerry Rollins uh, uh, passed, then we should deal with it. If there are a few things that will change the Constitution. I agree that the Constitution doesn't need to be amended that drastically. So, uh, Prof, I agree with you largely to that extent. I don't believe we need deputy ministers. I don't believe that. We don't. We just have, we can stay with ministers. A lot of them are my friends. I'm not taking their daily bread from them, and I'm not talking about current deputy ministers. I'm saying that a nation which is seeking to use its resources at this moment in time can do with ministers alone. Because our constitution is so permissive, and we have a situation where our people basically will agree with anything that the executive does. Now, if we have to amend that part, I will highly recommend not just creating a separation of cabinet and ministers, 
but just leave meeting into cabinet and that there shall be no minister other than cabinet. Every minister should be a cabinet minister. And we should abolish, we should set an upper limit and end there. We can cut costs. Council of State. I can see what the giggling is about. <laughs> to me, it is a silent advisor whose role may not be seen by many. And I don't have any doubt with the reputation of people there that they do advise. But this is perhaps the only quotation I will make relating to constitution, and I will read all. It's from Dr. Raymond Atuguba's uh, recent book on the constitution from the Garden of Aden to, uh, 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 to 2022. And I quote, he says the distinction between situations when the president must act, quote, in consultation with or in accordance with at the advice of the bodies of the Council of State in the course of his powers and appointment is quite bled. The Supreme Court decided in the case of the Ghana Bar Association and others versus Attorney General that the advice given to the president by the institutions such as the Council of State or the Judicial Council are merely advisory opinions and are thus not binding on the president. The fallout of this interpretation provided by the Supreme Court is an enhanced concentration of decision-making power in the executive president who already holds extensive powers under the Constitution. This decision, some have argued, is not in sync with the tenets of good governance, which will require that the overwhelming powers of the appointment of the president are minimized. I agree with Atugoba's view on that. But having heard that, said that, why set up an institution whose advice we don't need? <laughs> what is the purpose of a whole institution whose advice we will not take? And we spend so much money on it. Now, it gets even worse that when we increase regions, we increase the number of people in the Council of State and go through elections for advice which we will not take. My view and my recommendation is that, one, it's about time the Council of State, if we have to amend the Constitution, make the advice to the President public, except where the advice relates to national security matters. And we have to define the ambit of national security within which the advice cannot be made public. Two, Parliament must vote if it is demonstrated that after advising the president on two occasions, the president refused. That way, we will put in a fetter and we will indirectly compel the person to take good advice. I have asked a question. Did the Council of State, if anybody knows here, please forgive me and, ad and advise me. Did the Council of State advise on whether we should go to IMF or not? And the timing when we said we won't go to IMF, I don't have an idea. If they did, I don't know. But I will have thought that prior to getting into a haircut situation, it would have been good for the elders of the state to have given the advice. I don't have any doubt that they did, but the citizens have no way of knowing. And these are some of the things we need to be thinking about. The legislature, I hope they don't call me for uh, or the contempt, the privileged. <laughs> the privileged committee, but I think it is the most failed of the organs of the constitution, completely failed. I've already talked about the fact that even 137, 137 didn't change anything. You are supposed to hold the executive in check. And I don't need to explain anymore that. But we keep increasing the number to 275 now. And the emoluments keep increasing. Did they get their police escorts when they were asking for? I'm not so sure whether they did. But all these are charged to the consolidated fund. Now, the strange thing about the the parliament is that, for me, the most important committee has been left out of parliament, but I will deal with that. How did we get to the 275? Because after every 10 years, we do census, and the electoral commission, uh, then through some consultation, do the re re demarcation. America had that, but we must learn the mistakes of others. In 1929, America decided that you cannot continuously we are enforcing a provision in the American Constitution where every 30,000 people had to have one representative. And rather, they should fix an upper limit on the number. And the number should be the basis to divide the number of people who are represented. And after all, communication was improving. And therefore, it's easier to deal with constituents. So since 1929, 
the American Congress has remained at 437. And it doesn't matter how much the population increases. You have to now work the number backwards. If we continue going where we are going, I don't know when number of parliamentarians that we are going to, I mean, keep getting. But let's look at the committees of parliament. And again, for the avoidance of doubt, the distinction, to the best of my knowledge, and my MPs are here, they can correct me, is that they have select committees and standing committees and ad hoc committees as and when necessary. Select committees are those which are mimicking the ministries of the government. And the standing committees are the committees which are there, irrespective of the government, essentially. And ad hoc committees as and when necessary. Let's look at our committees in parliament. Appointments, business of parliament, committee on selection, finance, gender, assurances, government assurances, the house, etc., etc., etc. I have looked through and I've said this several times. I cannot find any committee on the economy. To the best of my knowledge, our parliament has never had any committee on the economy. Please don't confuse finance with the economy. There's a difference between spending money and planning. What we have done is to combine the buyer with the payer. Now, there is a small fault with the Constitution which leads to this. It is the creation of the National Development Planning Commission without making it a ministerial function. The idea was to enhance the power. However, it has had the adverse effects as a result of our culture. But having said that, my key point is that our parliament, to the best of my knowledge, have never had any committee that examines the economy as distinct from finances. And we confuse the two. Now, let's look at the countries we admire. UK has a committee on the economy, focusing on rural committee, a rural economy. They have a committee that looks at business, energy, and industrial strategy. In 2015, at a public lecture I did at the British Council, I advocated for the creation of a Ministry of Business Development and made this same argument that the failure to have a committee on the economy in Parliament is one reason why businesses are taxed to extinction. And I wrote and sent copies to both parties. It was about that and my campaign for center of the world, which I've been doing since 2011. Incidentally, the MPP took it and actually created a Ministry of Business Development in their first term and abandoned it in the second term. <laughs> so to the best of my knowledge, Parliament is not looking at business. Now in UK, when there was an intention to sell AstraZeneca, the Committee on Business had 254 citizens checking with business and society as to whether or not a single asset should be sold. That's what Parliament representing the people should do. In the United States, there is a joint committee on the economy. In Rwanda, they have a committee on the economy and trade. Now, Articles 1, 6, 7, 9, 10, 11, and 11 of the China Constitution actually enjoins the state to use productive resources of the state and put it in the state and make sure it is productive. When we go and borrow from China Development Bank, CDB, and are underwritten by Sino Lucio, they are all government entities. China Railway is a government entity. They won all the stadium contracts in, uh, in uh, Qatar. And if China is becoming, or it is the second fast, uh, uh, biggest economy, and I predict it to overtake the U.S. by 2030, not 2050, as many think, it is because they have utilized their state resources. I have already said how we have sold and global and all, and we are going to sell 17 more. Now, by the way, I'm also not an advocate of simply retaining them when they are making losses. It's our culture. It makes us misuse assets because our presidents will appoint the board, and instead of leaving the board to appoint the CEO, he will appoint the CEO, and the CEO and the board are always arguing because they both have assets. Yet, we have a company's code, and these are SOEs, under the company's code, and the company's code has no relevance. I want to repeat, no law is so good as to allow a person with evil mind to do the wrong thing, as to prevent a person with evil mind to do the wrong thing. The law is there. Ghana, we don't like laws. We have all the laws. All right. <clears throat> so I talked about China. In our case, under the Diversity Implementation Committee, PDNDC Law 326, we sold 80 enterprises even before the constitution came into force. Now, PNDC Law 326 for the awareness of doubt was passed in 1993, even though the enterprise was sold from 1986. So the law was retroactive, as it were. Then we passed at Forces 1, 
to convey strategic operations to the companies. And when we finished, we behave as if they are still strategic operations. Okay, let's move to the judiciary. My comment there, Mr. Chairman, is very simple. The Supreme Court needs an upper limit. Many people have said this. I'm not the only person saying that. Now, when I say upper limit, I mean the number of justices at the Supreme Court. There is something more important, which is a reason that has been made, and I want to emphasize it, why we need that. Anybody who knows judges will tell you that the older they get, the more matured and the more knowledgeable they become. So at 70, a Supreme Court judge is actually at his prime, now beginning to even mature more. But that's when we retire them. And we don't just retire them, but they are part of the people whose cost we continue to bear after they have retired. Why do we actually retire mature wine and continue to incur the cost? Why don't we extend the age limit so we can benefit from them whilst bearing the cost? And I'm a strong advocate that we will have the benefit of their wisdom for the length in which they stay there, plus saving the cost and by limiting the number. After all, the American Supreme Court has only nine judges, and it's always nine. Now, this chart you see is not limited to the Supreme Court or the judiciary, and I did that deliberately. It actually includes foreign affairs and the Ministry of Justice. But actually, it's a chart which shows between 1995 and now how much money we spend on people who have retired. And you will see that from 2005, it started shooting up. And by 2020, it went astronomical. That is how much we are spending on people whose wisdom we are not actually taking. And these are some of the things we need to take a second look at. Then there's a chapter 13 on Ministry of Finance, as I indicated. That ministry is quite a powerful ministry. And it's combining economic management with finance and imposing taxes on us. And that has been the case since 1993. So it's not about the current minister. And I've already explained that the part of the challenges come from how National Development Planning Commission was constituted. And we need to take a second look at that and either make it a cabinet ministry again as one of the main, uh, just one of the few changes in the constitution that we may need to make, or make it practical that we have a ministry of economic planning. I think Jambafo was recently appointed, and again, that ministry I don't think is anymore during the first term of this current government. But it, I, did, I did not feel their presence as an economic planning ministry, so that finance ministry will actually be responsible for expenditure disbursements. And Article 181, loans can be taken. Essentially, all that we need is parliamentary approval. I'm still not sure that there is any uh, loan that came to parliament and was rejected. I had some 500 million recently or so. I'm, I'm not so sure. If it was, we wouldn't be where we are. We didn't always be incurring debt. So I don't, um, I, as we give parliament an excuse for that. The public debt keeps increasing. And Article 183, the central bank, this is revolutionary and difficult for them to do. And I had occasion to tweet about this. That even if a theory becomes outdated, it takes boldness to actually depart from it. And especially when we mismanage our economy and go to IMF, it will be very difficult to depart from it unless the IMF itself has departed from it. So you will notice that for 50 years, Bank of Ghana has been looking for macroeconomic stability. We've all heard this word. We always, we buy fiscal and monetary, macroeconomic stability. We get it, and we become unstable again. Inflation targeting. The inflation, the last time I checked, was about 40-something or so. We've been targeting it. We've not been succeeding. Monetary policy increases. We've increased five times this year, and the inflation hasn't come down. Banks have collapsed, and I gave a retinue of banks which collapsed. I've, I've already gone through that slide. And killing the confidence in the banking sector. In fact, what we have done with the haircut is killing confidence in savings. The same old story occurs all the time. And cost of doing business becomes so high over the period. Maybe it's about time Bank of Ghana begin to think whether or not these traditional policies work. 
I hold a view, and I've granted an interview on TV on this, that I don't believe monetary policy increases in Ghana is an effective tool to manage inflation. At all, I don't. And the reasons are very simple. Because we are not the type of people who simply react as a result of increases in lending. Because many people don't have access to lending from the banks. Otherwise, it's almost impossible to have a situation where monetary policy rate has increased four, five times, and the inflation is actually going up. So it's about time we need to rethink. And by the way, Ghana is not the only entity which is looking at this. China and Turkey, over the last two and a half years, or two years actually, have refused to increase monetary policy rate, even though inflation was going up. Interestingly, both of them are now beginning to record a lesser inflation than the traditional countries like the US. China's inflation is actually going down. They refuse to increase money. In fact, China actually reduced its monetary policy rate. So at times, it is important to think about whether what we are doing is actually, and it's important because the Bank of Ghana is also a constitutional body. Public services keeps increasing. One of them is the National Center for Civic Education. I mean no harm, but besides the elections, I have not heard of any education which is coming from that sector. Maybe I'm ignorant and I'll take my word back if it is not uh, the case. Maybe they are not receiving the budget. But I'll be happy to know what the, the, the center is supposed to be doing. Are they focusing our mindset on self-reliance? What exactly is the center supposed to be doing besides elections? Shraj, depending on who is in charge, an institution can become powerful under the constitution. We all remember Emil Short. And uh, interestingly, I think I did hear Professor Bochy talk about that this morning. Everybody respected Shraj. But look at what the managers of the constitution have done. Now, the chart you see shows Shraj Iyoko, Office of Special Prosecutor. Article 218, Section 3A of Iyoko and Section 2A of OSP all made the same provision. And I go on and on and on. When it comes to remedy for recovery, you find it in all the three institutions. When it comes to the power to question subjects and investigate them, you find it in all the three. When it comes to bringing proceedings in court, you find it all the three. Essentially, we are just creating institutions to add to the public purse and come back and tax the people. Decentralization. This is one country which keeps cutting districts. Recently, I was at a lecture at the International Conference Center organized by the Ministry of Lands. And I spoke on town planning because I happen to have had the privilege to be the one who drafted the new town planning legislation, the Land Use and Special Planning Act. And the chief, incidentally, happened to be a former president of the House of Chiefs, asked a question regarding how come that, notwithstanding the law, uh, planning is haphazard. And I said, with all due respect, Nana, I will send the question back to you. You are the chiefs who go demanding for creation of districts. And when districts are created, it's in consultation with the Electoral Commission. The Electoral Commission manages people above 18. Nobody checks whether they are auto photo maps, whether they are planners. At a certain point, when Ghana had about 150 districts, we had only 70 qualified planners. You can check. How do you expect adequate planning? When you are creating districts, because during the election, somebody comes to you and you promise, he promises you a region and you give his blessing, even though chiefs are supposed to be nonpartisan. So, a society where we put pressure to divide us becomes very difficult to understand. We create an ecosystem that destroys us. In fact, in the recent election for the creation of the regions, I saw NDC and MPP people coming together to fight for the creation of regions. In other words, the only time we united was to divide us. They united so they could divide us into regions. Now, when you create a region, you actually are needing a new regional hospital, a new national house of chiefs, new regional administration. You are adding to the public purse. I've given you the reference to the Rwandan constitution, which says don't bring any bill to parliament if that bill is going to increase cost unless you can show where the revenue is coming from or unless it is reducing cost. We keep increasing cost. Creation of districts is not a very simple thing. What is different if instead of, for example, dividing northern region into three, we decided to build a big hospital in each of the areas we divided? 
And the truth is, after dividing this, you've not found the funds for them anyway. Nothing has changed. So it's about time we took a second look at this. The worst is that fiscal decentralization we are not doing. Fiscal decentralization is letting the money go to the districts so that they can spend. We are not sending the money there. So we are just dividing them to cosmetic purposes. So if you look at this race, in 1957, we had 58, 71, 65. We had a 7. And uh, 1988, BNDC, we went to 108, we had a 43. Then the constitution came into force. Then we added 2 immediately. Then 2003, we added 28 to 138. 2007, we added 32 to make it 170. 2012, we added 46 to make it 216. 2018, we added 38 to make it 254. 2019, we added 6 to make it 260. And 2020, one more to make it 261. Almost coterminous with, with, with MPs. Which explains why the ambulances was easy to distribute to constituencies. It's important that we recognize that these are costs. And please remember, I started by showing you the levies imposed on citizens for these costs. That is why I started with that, so that I show you where the cost centers come from. When they are arguing in parliament, they are arguing to let you pay. <laughs> Regions, you were 557, 60, we became 7, 78, 82, 9, 83, 10, and 2018, 16. The constitution which gives this power also makes a provision that you can merge districts and regions. None of them has been merged. And as I speak, some are still lobbying for further division. New Highway Administration. I recently had occasion to address Ghana Highway Authority. And I saw new regional directors. Plenty. Each of them will require a car, etc. Public lands is supposed to be protected. The chaos, I don't want to go there. But there is a provision, 264, which guarantees tenure of office. You can check this record. I may be wrong, but I don't know one executive secretary of National Lands Commission since 1993 who has finished his term. They've all been removed. Maybe the current one will finish his. All of them get removed. That's an independent commission under the Constitution. I want to repeat, no law, no law is adequate enough for a person who intends to do the wrong thing from doing it. All right. Yet land is a factor of production. And this is one reason businesses find it difficult. When the World Bank used to do the doing business index, land was always one of the most difficult areas if you took a look at the challenges. Natural resources, the less said, the better. I've already talked about how we've sold Anglo Gold and all those. But that aside, I did hear Bank of Ghana is buying gold recently. I agree 100% with that policy. It's a very good policy. However, I thought the Constitution says that all natural resources are for the people and the president holds his interest. And therefore, if the gold is already for us, why is Bank of Ghana buying that which is already for us? <laughs> Shouldn't the gold be held in trust somewhere already for us that we should just collect and keep a Bank of Ghana? It means that unlike China who protected their natural resources, we dissipate our national resources. The only exception so far I've seen, incidentally, happened under this government, which is bauxite and iron ore, where there are laws 709, I think so, uh, no, 779 and 798, to ban bauxite and iron ore exports, even though, to the best of my knowledge, they have not been banned yet. It's, the law is passed in future, as it were, but at least it's an attempt. So when it came to gold, which is ours, but by the way, there are countries in this world when if you find gold, it's your gold. If you find gold in America, it's your gold. If you find oil, it's your oil. And they are not broke. We who went you find gold is for the government. The government is now looking for money to buy gold. <laughs> Strange. And that's the constitution we operate. Chieftaincy, I've already said to, my, to the best of my assessment, has become a major problem. Commissions of inquiry, the constitution makes provision for that. So I took a check on the commissions which have been set up. I didn't see any on business. I cited the example of UK's AstraZeneca earlier. 
but I saw one on Ayawasu elections, judgment debt. I will need more than five minutes, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> but I will speed up. Ayawasu elections, judgment debt, and I had, I don't know whether it's privilege of appearing twice before the judgment debt commission. And I told Justice Yawapau that nobody is going to implement his report. And actually nobody implemented. Yeah, I told him, it was public hearing, I told him about a minister who actually added $300,000 to a recommendation that I had made openly. This is public information. Yeah, I made a recommendation, and the minister thought that the person should add $300,000 more. And that minister was so pursuing a previous regime, but yet he decided to add more. How he got the money, or how, whether it was a favor that he, I don't know. But he called me to ask, why am I giving a recommendation and not adding something to the person who is claiming it? And I asked him, what will happen if 10 years we are all summoned to answer this question? Exactly five years. I was summoned for the judgment debt commission. Anyway, so it's about time we set up commissions to check the economy. What takes us to IMF 17 times? I would expect parliament to push for such a commission to be set up so that we don't get into a situation where we keep going. Now, all these things occur, Mr. Chairman, because we have a permissive ecosystem which allows users of the Constitution to abuse it and create cost escalations and are not punished for the infractions, except a few when they are out of power and citizens are burdened as a result. Now, an ecosystem consists of diverse things, and soon I will get arithmetical. It consists of the people and their behavior and their culture. Their attitudes, whether they are power, they are power distance people, people who believe others should be more powerful than them. The law that regulates them, the historical issues, for example, were they a colony, did they have a military regime, and how they respond to future events. To do this assessment, I decided to do a quick assessment of how the constitution itself and how the managers have performed, and I'll give them a score. And I simply took the Legatum Prosperity Index, on which Ghana scored 99, was on, was on number 99 out of 146. Now, I am not going to use that score. I'm going to use my score as the speaker for the day. Safety and security, where the Constitution allows us to prevent conflicts, etc. I score seven, and seven is a high mark although we have hodgepodge of flashpoints. Personal freedom has called nine. The Constitution has got copious provisions, and to the best of my knowledge, it has been highly protected. There are a few infractions every now and then. Governance pillar, which protects, checks and balances, and restrains the government from doing excessive things when it comes to corruption, etc. My score is two, and I think that's a generous score. Now, the next one is social capital, which is a pillar that checks personal relationships, institutional trust, etc., and civic participation. My score is three. Now, investments, the environment which encourages people to invest and have ready access uh, uh, for investment, my score is four. I give the reasons below uh, there. Enterprise conditions where it looks at the degree to which regulations enable businesses to start and expand. My score is two. If you have a situation where businesses are taxed all the time, they cannot expand. And that, too, is quite a generous score. And as we know, access to capital and cost of capital is quite high. We even forget cost of power. Recently, I heard that Ghana is one of the, the leading countries when it comes to uh, cost of power domestically. Yes, that's true. But we are number 16 when it comes to cost of power to industry. And that makes us uncompetitive in an AFC-FTA world. Infrastructure uh, facilities compared to other African countries, I give six. Then economic quality pillars, which looks at how we are able to generate wealth individually, I give one. Initially, I actually gave zero. And I took a look at it and gave one. Living conditions and quality of life, uh, shelter, basic services, I give two. Health and access to health services as availability, I give six. Education and pillars, I've already told you that I support free SHS, notwithstanding the challenges that has to be overcome, it has to be properly funded, I give seven. 
natural environment where we protect our natural resources for posterity, I give two. We all know the story of Galamse, etc., and therefore I don't need to justify that. Having said that, the score on my sheet average for the constitution itself is quite high. But the score for the users of the constitution was 4.5. In other words, the users of the constitution have performed abysmally, even though the constitution itself is well crafted for our prosperity. The users appear to be heading in the wrong direction. Now let's go mathematical. For a ecosystem to thrive, for us to achieve the prosperity we all desire, it must take a look at the contemporary events. And contemporary events include how opposition opposes governments, just for opposition's sake, or with constructive criticism. How demand for new regions are made by chiefs, etc. How allegations of vote rigging will end up in court instead of any court decision as to whether we can interpret the constitution as to whether our economic rights are being abused. Those are internal conditions that create the ecosystem. External one would include global price hikes, Ukraine war, shortage of wheat and iron rust, dollar pressure, some of which we always use as an excuse as to why we have challenges and hiccups. And every single finance minister in the constitution has said the problem is from external shocks. If we have a constitution which we cannot implement to withstand external shocks, and we have cited this so many times, then we have a problem. I once had a tweet where I said that even the enterprises we privatized ended up becoming bankrupt. A society where enterprises in public hands and private hands go bankrupt needs to re-examine the mindset of the elite. So mathematically, if I were to represent this, contemporary excuses which we give will be CE plus divided citizenry, which I started with everything is NDC, MPP, minus absence of a focus strategy we don't have. We have moved from, uh, 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 I will touch on that, we've moved from one strategy to the other. If you add a con contemporary excuses we give to divided citizenry, citizenry and you don't have a focus strategy, you get economic doom, which is the topic for my discussion, positing the constitution. And the economic doom will be sped up. However, if we have strategy and it's focused, it helps. For example, when I started making the argument about the center gonna be the center of the world, the only person who used to talk about it uh, was a certain gentleman in Tema who was using it for also other purposes. And I was surprised to hear that this argument actually came up at a PNDC cabinet meeting. Ghana is actually the last land that the Greenwich Meridian goes through before it enters the sea. And it's exactly five degrees above the equator. I've seen some advert on, on TV, CNN, where they say we are on the equator. We are not on the equator. We are five degrees above the equator. But there's no land at that intersection point. It is the only point where merchant navy staff come to park, as it were, come to dock and perform ceremonies because it's the only place you can be in the eastern and the western hemisphere at the same time. I have several videos, you can check them on YouTube, as to the power of location branding, which cannot be challenged. I wrote a whole paper to a president who didn't read it. <laughs> now, in the period of the Constitution, we borrowed over $100 million from the World Bank to implement a gateway concept to turn Ghana into a gateway. And I have said over and over, if the Lord puts you at the center and you want to be the gate, you have a problem. <laughs> you have a big cultural problem. Now, hopefully, the writing will be done. And nobody has spoken to me. The government has been using it. Nobody has spoken to me or to the best of my knowledge, some of the people who propagated this, Koya team, for example, of CTFM was one of the people that we were pushing this. I mean, we talked about it everywhere, printed T-shirts, etc. But it doesn't matter. The fact that it is being done gradually is enough. On a different lecture, we can talk about its power and what we can do. But from the gateway, we moved to Vision 2020, we moved to GPRS 1 and 2, Better Ghana, and now Ghana Beyond Age. Now, the Constitution throughout this period, Mr. Chairman, has become a perfect guide for the duopoly of political parties, as I said, 
who undermine each other to take over persons to which they incur more debt for the country and real terms make their people poorer, whilst each side claim to be the only solution to the problem they both created. That is a situation where the management, managers of the constitution have put us. How do we get out? I believe the mathematical presentation of that is where the ecosystem is the denominator and the numerator will be contemporary events because those events will still occur and we don't control them. Leadership choices which we need to make but because our leadership don't make the right choices all the time and they make political choices. If you want to know how leadership decisions are made in this country and there's no exception, check there's a, a three-step procedure. One, will you give me an advantage over my political opponent? Two, will he make the decision maker himself enhance his political uh, uh, career? Three, can I justify it by some other rational means without making reference to the first two? These are the three point criteria by which decisions are made. And so therefore, the decisions are made on, not made on leadership choices for the posterity that we promise under the Constitution to save, neither for the living nor for the yet to be born. So, contemporary events, Ukraine war, we don't control. Inflation, we don't control. In fact, IMF has said there will be a recession of the ter a third of the world next year. So, contemporary events plus leadership choices, plus citizens' response in an economy or ecosystem of the type we have, citizens must respond properly and depoliticize themselves. Over the ecosystem, we get to a speedy attainment of prosperity. And I chose to talk about the economic doom or prosperity. So what is this report card? You can see it. Debt exchange, restructuring, one million people going into poverty, haircut, hopefully we won't have a haircut in future. It appears that if we stick to what we are doing, Mr. Chairman, we will face the economic doom. But having said that, Mr. Chairman, I started without the necessary salutations. And I'm not oblivious that I failed to wish you the necessary salutations at this time of the year. But I did that deliberately. It is because I know it is customary at this time of the year to wish everybody a happy new year and a prosperous new year. But when I started taking a look at this constitution, I realized that one, prosperity is actually a constitutional issue. And prosperous new year comes from the prosperity or release the prosperity. And to wish you a happy new year, happiness, not necessarily as a result of prosperity, but people tend to relate the two to each other. And when I looked at the preamble to the constitution itself, it says, in the name of the almighty God, we, the people of Ghana, in the exercise of our natural and inalienable right to establish a framework of government, we shall secure for ourselves and posterity the blessings of liberty, which I have scored very high, equality of opportunity, which I have scored quite low, and prosperity. I thought that my Happy New Year greetings should be posited on the Constitution. Having established a constitutional basis, I now wish you, Mr. Chairman, the audience online and here, a happy and a prosperous New Year. Thank you. I think our speaker deserves another round of applause. Please let's do that for Thank you so much. The lawyer who has come to shred the law, not into pieces, but into compartments. Thank you so much for helping us. A few things that I should have done before we started. The washroom is to my left, this door, or you could go out all the way and come to this corner. Apologies, I didn't do that before we started. Secondly, who and who are here, everybody's here, but there are some people who always get mentioned. So I have to mention them, because if I don't mention them, it means I've breached protocol, and it is by law. Until the constitution is repealed, the whole house that you should not drag him uh, to, to the Privileges Committee. Thank you so much. 
Madam Bridget Jogbenoko was the PPP's flag bearer for the elections of 2020. Please give us a wave. Thank you so much. <laughs> Stanislav Huesa Dugbe is aide to former President Mahama. Uh, they told me you are in here somewhere. Give us a wave. Okay. <laughs> Stan Dugbe. And then Dr. Evans Agrinaku is Chief Director of the Ministry of Parliamentary Affairs. Thank you for joining us. Amma Sindip is CEO of IPMC. Thank you so much for joining us. Alhaji Abdulaziz is the CEO of Global Haulage. Thank you for being with us. Mr. Salah Kalmoni is MD of Advanced Construction. Thank you for coming here too. Victoria Hajar is second vice president of Ghana Employers Association. There are people who look for you when we leave here. Thank you so much. Gwekwa Ajimandua is CEO of the Association of Companies that have increased our petroleum products recently, but they've decided to reduce it, OMCs. Thank you so much, sir. Is the petrol going to go down uh, next year? Okay. So I was supposed to sit with um, our guest and ask questions, but I don't want to be greedy and selfish. Instead, I'll throw the microphone to the audience. And there's a crime I've committed by not acknowledging the one who hosted us here, the Dean of the Law Faculty of UAP UPSA. Kofi Agoji, please give us a wave. <laughs> Samson Ladi Ayenini is uh, he's a lawyer with Multimedia Group Host News for Samson. I've seen you in the back there. Give us a wave. Thank you. Manasseh doesn't want me to do this, but I have to do it. He's an um, investigative journalist. Manasseh Azuria, will you please give us a wave? Why are you hiding? Uh -huh, thank you so much. I'll acknowledge as we proceed. But for now, what I want to do is, if you have a comment or a question, kindly show by hand. But before then, I would invite the two members of parliament to give us just two minutes each commentary on what he has said, maybe specifically on the one that bothers on parliament or the constitution generally, because they are both lawyers. I heard them calling each other senior, senior. I don't know who is senior, but so who is a senior? Okay, <laughs> Councillor Atachia, please give us two minutes quick response. Maybe we can do it from there. I'll just give the microphone. Can I have an extra microphone, please, from the back? Okay, I'm told you have to be here for the camera, so uh, kindly. Okay. Okay, Thank you so much. I'm particularly excited that I came because it's a very, very, very thought provoking lecture. And uh, it's going to enrich my own thinking. But I have a problem with what he said, that when he gives lectures, he doesn't deliver a paper. But I, as a lawyer, I know of the Hamlin lectures, which can take you to um, 1917. So the people who are not in this room, how are they going to have the benefit of um, what you said when you are not even there? So please, you need to change your style and document, <laughs> document what you think. Because at the end of the day, how Jesus succeeded against the devil, he said, it is written. <laughs> what is written is eternal. So David, with the greatest of respect to you, do not just talk into the air so that my grandson will come and read what you said. I was also a bit, I mean, concerned that what did you eat in the morning and you were drinking water like that? <laughs> I mean, I was surprised. You have been drinking water, this small lecture to the water you drank. What is the meaning of this? Yeah. But that is a joke, yes. Well, this disquisition is extremely excellent. And I do not think I can improve on what he said. Very, very important. The only thing that I have a challenge with all the time is to just ignore the end of the equation, the masses, and the mentality of the masses. In all that he said, I mean, it's important. The constitution is there. The constitution is intended to improve the people. But what is the mentality of the masses? That, dis that discussion is always absent. Let me tell you one of the things that I see also, that the people will have the government they want. Today, as we are making discussions, Somebody believes that I will not vote you into power unless you give me money. I'm about to help you, but if I, you don't pay the gate fee, I will open you to come and help you. It's there. And we should look at it. At the end of the day, uh, the poverty of the poor is your own poverty. So the man brings you, the man who is not very competent to help, brings you a few coins to get the power. And it doesn't have much input. So we should look at that dimension also. Because at the end of the day, 
if you don't want to elect good people, you have good government. That is my humble view. And good people should not be the ones who are saying that, oh, I have big ideas, but my pocket is not deep. So you shut off all the um, good people who come and, excuse me to say, practice the constitution and improve the constitution and improve the life of the people. And then the averages will go. By reason of the coins they give to the masses. And that area is my heartbeat. And in good time, I'm also going to address it. So, David, you've done a powerful job. And I'm very, very enriched. I mean, I mean uh, this morning that I came. And I'm looking forward to um, finding more of the lectures that you've done. I've never heard them or read them. And it's going to help me so much. Thank you very much for what you've done. Thank you so much, Honorable Atacha. Please, please follow him on Twitter. <laughs> he has a lot of stuff there. Council. Thank yes. You. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, you know, standing on all the protocols that have been established, I want to thank my former partner and a very good friend, uh, DOD, David Ofosudote, for a very excellent lecture. I left my constituency yesterday night. Um, having spent one week there, I wanted to spend more time. But uh, when uh, I got the invitation, I called you and I said, I'm going to cut short the visit so I can be here this morning. And that's why I'm here. And, you know, you know, it's um, the thing that Atatje said. I have been very much enriched by the lecture this morning. It's a very excellent lecture, um, but I have wished that you had a paper, just like uh, Honorable Atachi has said, that we can always refer to. There's one thing that David and I agree on, which I said here last year at this uh, uh, same forum. I said, the problem is not with the Constitution. The problem is with us and with the operators of the Constitution. That's the, 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 the exact same words that I use, the operators of the Constitution. David calls them the users of the Constitution. We have a very excellent Constitution that provides you know, the framework of governance. And it says in Article 1 of the Constitution that we must exercise the powers of government to enhance the welfare and prosperity of our citizens. Somehow or another, um, since 1993, we have not lived up to that billing, and the managers of the Constitution are the ones who are to blame for everything. But uh, I had two questions to ask, and I want to take this opportunity to ask those two, uh, questions. There were some two things that you said that struck me as very profound. That is the issue of taxation, and your proposal that we should limit, we should have you know, um, a limit. I don't know whether it's going to be a statutory limit or, a, uh, you know, a limit imposed by interpretative, uh, you know, the exercise of the interpretative jurisdiction of the Supreme Court on how much taxes we can bear as citizens. But you would all agree with me, wouldn't you, that there's a symbiotic relationship between citizenship and taxation. Um, the question of taxation without, without representation, which you know, animated all the political agitations and upheavals that resulted in, you know, the Magna Carta and all those wonderful documents that have underpinned Western constitutional democracy um, showed that this symbiotic relationship must exist between the government and the governed. Now, would you agree with me that it is the utilization of the taxes that is the problem and not the mere fact of the inter imposition of the taxes. Because if you look at all the taxes that you, li I mean, uh, you listed, all right, Parliament had good intentions in imposing them. But how have they been utilized? The GET Fund that you mentioned, we have misused it. National Health Insurance Levy that you mentioned, we have misused it, and so on. So the problem, in my view, 
is with how the taxes are utilized and not with the mere imposition of the taxes. Would you agree? On the issue of the binding or non-binding character of uh, advice proffered to the president, you know, the case that was cited in uh, Professor Tugugu's book um, was a case that I personally argued before the Supreme Court. That is the case of GBA and Attorney General. You know, if you read the report, you would uh, see the angle that I took, which was eventually accepted by the Supreme Court. I had taken the view that as far as appointments are concerned, the Constitution is very explicit that the appointing authority is the president. You realize that the crux of the issue there was the appointment of justices of the Supreme Court and whether or not the advice provided by the Judicial Council must be binding on the president. So we took the view, and that is the Attorney General took the view that that advice should not be binding because if, they, if it is binding, it then means that the Judicial Council becomes the appointing authority because whatever it says with respect to, I mean, a nominated justice, then is binding on the, on the president. But David, I want you to probably clarify one thing in relation to the binding character of advice. I take the view that non-binding advice is not necessarily bad advice. And that binding advice is not necessarily good advice. So again, it comes down to how the advisee utilizes the advice that has been given. Right? So if a, if a president has been giving good advice with respect to a nominee for the position of, let's say, minister, deputy minister, or a chief executive, or, I mean, Supreme Court appointee, and so on, and the president decides to act, ignore that advice and go ahead and appoint that person. Is it the fault of the advisor or the fault of the advisee? And does that, I mean, boil down to the constitutional character of the advice that was being given, whether it is binding, the legal character of the advice, whether it is binding or non-binding advice? I want you to clarify that. Um, thank you very much for a wonderful lecture. Um, as Atachia has said, we have been very enriched, and I would have wished that we had, uh, you know, a written document that we could file in the law libraries for future law students to refer to. But thank you. God bless you. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Dominic Ayine, former Deputy Attorney General. Um, David, I think what they are doing is they are setting a trap for you. If you have it in print, they will give it to the speaker. It's good you don't have it in print. <laughs> I, I, we should also just quickly hear from Dr. Dr. Nyaho Nyaho Tamakulu before you. Doc, if you could just come here. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I won't be able to stand long like the others have done because I'm 80 years old. <laughs> Firstly, I would like to thank the speaker, the lecturer, and I don't regret at all for coming here. Because he spoke on issues that we are aware of in this country. Our problem is how to handle it. To me, it is the inability of the Ghanaian, be you a leader or an ordinary person in society, to say no on principle. That is our problem. If our ministers can say no on principle, they will resign. And I believe if we had been in a democratic institution, most of the ministers would have resigned because we are trending wrongly. It takes some time to build up a democracy. At the same time, we shouldn't forget the same democracy can be destroyed within a second. All I will say to the lecturer, 
that he's opened gates that will help the people of this country. We have to learn the culture of resignation. If we did that or we do that, the problems of this country will be solved. Thank you. Okay, so uh, uh, thank you, uh, and it's a pleasure to meet you for the first time, Dr. Yahweh Makulu, uh, and thanks for your advice, and also I agree with you completely on the issue of people being not bold enough to, I mean, to, to resign or to say no. I had occasion to serve on the board of a state institution. And everything was going wrong on that, I mean. Now one day, told the chairperson, I wasn't coming to the board meeting again. In fact, they sent the board allowances to my office and the Christmas hamper, and I sent it back. Now that's a state institution. And I said, there's no point, I mean, sitting on this board if you wouldn't do the right thing. The chairperson came to see me, and I said, no, I won't come back. When you begin to change your mindset, some of us are ready to... I think it's something that we need to encourage and something that maybe the Center for Civic Education, I mean, should be encouraging people to do more. So uh, I, I agree with you. On the question of uh, uh, non-binding advice, uh, Dr. Aini, who happens to be my former partner, just by the way, uh, some of us really don't care too much about partisan politics. My two partners, uh, when I started the firm, initially was Yabwabia Samwa, and then Dominic Aini uh, came. So one NDC, one MPP. Uh, I don't know. They were both in parliament at some point. I don't know how they manage this politics. I, I, just, I just cannot wrap my head around it. I mean, uh, having said that, on the question of binding and unbinding advice, I think I addressed the issue. My point is that the advice should not be binding. But the Council of States, so not the Judicial Council, the Council of States advice, except when the advice is security-related, should be made public. That's my recommendation. So that if they recommend or they make, give advice to the president consecutively twice, and that's what I said, that he doesn't accept it, parliament should be made to vote on that advice. It's a way of limiting the power of the president. And I oppose the question, did anybody advise the president not to go to IMF or to go to IMF? Because I think we should have gone to IMF. I think we went at the wrong time. And the reason is very simple. The debt suspension agreement was there, and I believe we had gone at the right time. We would have signed the debt suspension agreement in the Paris Club of Creditor Nations, and probably the situation would have been less strenuous than we have now. So I would be happy to know if an organ like the Council of State gave advice. Definitely I wouldn't know, and I believe that they did. But in going forward, the few recommendations I have about the Constitution is that that advice should stop being secret. If a person dispenses with good advice, and I agree, advice is not necessarily good or bad, but if a person consistently dispenses you good advice, then we ought to know. Then the people's representative will know that you are not listening to advice. And then it will be a way of judging the president. And, and, and that's my recommendation. On the question of tax, also I think I explained, and let me drink water. And I touch just for avoidance of doubt. I drink water all the time. <laughs> it's not because I took anything this morning. <laughs> In fact, I have not eaten. It is my way of keeping my body rehydrated, and especially when I speak. So those who listen to me know that I drink water all the time. Yeah, so, so, so that's it. <laughs> that explains it. But coming back on tax, I think you take it to the point of, uh, of whether or not the problem is tax utilization. Uh, I disagree completely. The problem is not just tax utilization. It's just one of them. Now, in Nigeria, during the, the tenure of uh, uh, Governor Spashola in Lagos, he was known to have utilized the tax so well that people were calling radio stations asking where they could pay tax. So I agree that if you utilize tax very well. But that's not my issue here. There are two problems with taxation. One is that those who pay the tax are the only people who are paying. 
and give me a couple of minutes to explain this. My law firm has been audited by GRE every single year since 2010. Every year. They poor people there. In fact, the more I speak, the more they come. <laughs> and they will audit you and audit and audit and audit. And anytime I can say, okay, I know some businesses have never been audited. GRE itself said that 62% of Ghanaian enterprises have never been audited. This is GRE statement. Yes, about four months ago. That they've only audited 38%. If you've audited 38% and you're always auditing the 38%, a lot of people are not paying tax. And I'll come to that. So you keep auditing. In, in fact, somebody said in Ghana, if you make the mistake of paying tax, then they come after you. Don't pay in the first place. <laughs> so the truth is that we are not adequately collecting the tax. And therefore, a few of us are overburdened. Which is why I make a recommendation, and I'm, I'll answer your question. Anytime the tax goes above a certain percentage, and I can give you a percentage. Look, even God's tithe is 10%. Corporate tax is 25. Average tax in terms of income, individual income ranges anything between 3% or zero if you are below a certain line to about 15%. Once you cross a certain point, you are going to as 35%. My view is that any time an individual's income tax goes above 40%, there should be a legislation preventing the government from doing that. Similarly, corporate tax should not go above 25. And I'm going to draw your attention to something that I want to draw the public's attention to. There has been the G20 have said that there should be global minimum tax, corporate tax of 15%. I want you to find out whether GRA is coming up with any policy on that. What I want us to avoid is a situation where big global corporates are made to reduce their tax here to 15%, which will then begin to tax more domestic businesses like Amaz Company, which are located here. Because so far as I'm concerned, the global 15% tax is a minimum. It doesn't mean you cannot go above. And therefore, we, all we need is that let's have a limit as to how much you can tax corporate. And, and because if we don't, we keep adding the levies. And how do we arrive at that? We arrive at that not just by corporate and income tax. No. We add all the levies, excluding VAT. That's what VAT is just an expenditure tax. The things that you are levying me for, COVID happens, and you are levying me 1%. All the things you levy me for that enable me get my income to more than 40%. Because once you cross 40%, you are denying me of disposable income. That is the concept why when you take a bank loan, they check whether you already have a debt somewhere. Once it's you, are, you are already paying more than 40%, they won't be able to give you the loan. So that's my, my recommendation. There's another more serious recommendation. Every government, no exception has always said you need to op increase the tax net. That has everyone. Why haven't we? So two things. One, there should be a legislation that ch ch judges the government on whether or not they are actually increasing the tax bracket. And I made several recommendations here. Maybe it was missed. We missed the voter ID. If we turn the voter ID into bank accounts, we bring everybody into the bank accounts. And I'll show you why, how we can do that very easily. We miss e-levy. We should not have used e-levy to tax as a basis for taxing Momo. We should have used Momo as a basis for opening bank accounts for everybody. Why? Because if you move the 5 million, who GRE can easily check their bank accounts and audit them? Look, I was on a panel one day. A person applied for a job from GRE, for a job as an auditor. And then he asked, at the end of the interview panel, I, I, I asked him, what salary are you expecting? Then he said, oh, just what you are paying here. And I'm like... What do you mean what you are paying? How do you know? He said, ah, I'm a GRE. I check the taxes, that, uh, the, in, what the salaries of people, of companies before I apply for a job. <laughs> yes. So he knew how much that was. Now, I'm saying this because once you have a bank account, it's easy for GRE to track how much you are earning and come after you. What about if you don't have a bank account? So if we had used a voter ID card or... The, the mumu to put everybody in the bank account, I would have done something very simple. And it's not too late for us to do it. I would have introduced a turnover tax. A turnover tax of 5% of everybody who doesn't have a TIN number. If you don't have a TIN number, we should assume that 5% of every money you earn is actually turnover that I should tax. I won't introduce mumu. I would rather tax you on a turnover on the money that goes through your mumu, and the telcos should deduct it instantly. It's an easier way it puts everybody into the tax bracket. It forces people to get a TIN number because for you not to be paying turnover tax, you will take a TIN number. 
That is the way to broaden the tax net. In a modern economy, if you are failing to broaden the tax net, the issue is not about utilization of tax. It's about how much you are not collecting the taxes and punishing those who are paying. Now, let me go to the next, so I've dealt with the taxation issue. Uh, I think the others were comments, yeah, that I, I don't really, yeah, I'll touch on the water part. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let's hear from you now. Uh, I have a microphone floating around. Let's start from here. Just introduce yourself and ask your question or comment. Hello, my name is Amar D. Pari, Executive Chairman of IPMC. Two uh, comments from my side. First is a comment, and the second would be a question to, uh, to David. The comment would be on the advisory role being uh, played by the Council of States, and to use the India example, where we have the Council of States, which is called the Upper House or the Rajya Sabha. Uh, if we introduce checks and balances, as is present in other countries, so any bill which is uh, passed in the parliament or the lower house must go to the upper house, in this case the Council of States, for the final approval. Uh, and, uh, and the upper house or the Council of States has, can reject the bill two times. That's the only thing they can do. They can reject it two times. Eventually the bill can get passed, but by that time the media and all citizens would know that this bill is, has been rejected by two times and why it was, so they can make up their mind next time whether we should elect this party or not. Uh, that would be... Now, coming to my question, uh, one of the conclusions, and I think uh, uh, the main conclusion, David, your presentation has been that the Constitution is strong, but the, it's the users or the operators of the constitutions which need to be disciplined. And in this case, we need to bring certain amendments in the constitution, uh, which I think will reduce the powers of the, of the users. But it's the same people who are into power, and how will they allow such amendments which reduce their powers? Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, from this block, do I have any hand up? This block. Yes. Are the is there a hand there? Okay. Yes. Um, sorry, there's a hand here. Uh, my name is Justice Abdullahi. Thank you. So, um, Sina, my question is that you make the argument for Supreme Court justices to have an extended period at the Supreme Court. I think the same argument goes for all other civil and public servants. Because at that age, you also get matured. They get more experienced, and they can, they can indeed offer better services to the people of Ghana. Would you, by that argument, advocate for a complete extension of time for all other public and civil servants, rather than limiting it to members of the Supreme Court? Thank you. Thank you so much, Justice. Um, do I have any more hands here? I think there's one at the extreme end at the back. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Samson Ampon Sanyeji. So um, I'll build on the question of my lecturer, Justice Abdullah. On the Supreme Court justices, you were making an advocacy that we consider possibly extending their ages of retirement because we may draw from their years of experience. Um, looking at the nature of our legal system and the fact that appeals, we have appeals which arise as of right so that the case can travel from the district court right to the Supreme Court and even on review and the fact that in recent times it is clear that there's a lot of burden on our Supreme Court would you not rather advocate that we extend the jurisdiction of our Court of Appeal so that possibly we make our Supreme Court a constitutional court in that way if we limit the justices to 9 or 15 the burden of work that will be on them will be lower as compared to rather trying to extend their ages because the um, old age comes with frailties and Dr. Nyahu himself demonstrated today that it's not easy <laughs> being 80 and being a Supreme Court judge. And the fact that we don't even have a culture of resignation. We may have 95 year olds who still want to sit on the bench even though uh, they cannot even write a thing. So I want you to 
Kai founder. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. I'm going to take the answers from here, then, then when I come back, we'll take from this group, starting with Bridget. So, yes. Thank you. I mean, on the question of extending the, the retirement age of Supreme Court judges, I think there are two questions relating to that. The, the last one, I think my problem has to do with the fact that they belong to the group of people who uh, two things generally, it is believed they get matured, more matured at that age. And even more important for me, remember my lecture was about the economic doom issue. It's about the cost, and I showed a chart on the cost we incur on people who have retired. And that is the problem. So if you, for example, and I'm not looking for the American extension of, I mean, no limit to the age. If you had them for five more years, ten more years, and limit the number, because there were two recommendations, limit the number, cap the number, and extend the, the, the age, uh, I, st I think I still stand by that recommendation. Uh, having said that, whether I will extend it to all public servants, the answer is no. Uh, not all public servants retire on their salary. Uh, not all public servants are Supreme Court judges. <laughs> and, and it is of a character that worldwide, it tends to have that, that character. So that, that, that would be my recommendation. There was a question from uh, Mr. Ama about how I expect the very people who are, for, a, for want of a better way, benefiting from the system to implement. Actually, I'm not expecting that. That is why I commend UPSA and one Ghana women for le lectures like this, because at the end of the day, it is when people talk and say these things more and more that eventually it governs, uh, it gathers some kind of momentum. And when people are ever given the chance to amend the constitution, they look at these things. I highly recommend that we should look at the constitution more as an economic issue than pure legalists. That's one of the problems I think um, uh, we have. Uh, I think there was an earlier question that was asked that I didn't answer. That was from Mr. Tachia on the citizen's mindset. If you look at the formula, I talked about citizen's responses. If I break down the citizen's responses mathematically, the mindset is number, it's actually number one. And it's something I tweet about at least twice a, a, a week. It's a major issue. But the mindset problem is also caused by politicians. Because politicians end up, as it were, paying their way into power. You see, I have been asked several times why, 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 why I don't go into politics. And I once tweeted a response to that. Somebody said, ah, you keep making good recommendations, but the price good men pay for not going into politics is that they are ruled by bad men. I'm paraphrasing it. And I said, I disagree with Socrates and Plato completely. There are many people who are not, they can't disagree with. Look, I read Plato, I read Socrates, but I'm free to disagree with them when their system is either wrong as at now, because at times we tend to use present circumstances over past circumstances. Many of the things we call culture, as somebody said, are actually solutions whose problem we have forgotten. Now, let me explain this. In Plato and Socrates' time, they were amphitheaters. This whole, everybody could gather into this place and, this, and debate. And therefore, if you were a good person or you have ideas and you don't come and debate, you'll be ruled by people with bad ideas. That's true. But that's not true today. Today, it is easier, and that was my, my tweet, it is easier for a corrupt person to buy his way into parliament than for a good, honest man to get an assembly seat. And the price good people pay for entering into politics is that they are overwhelmed by bad people. I can guarantee you, and you know this, there are many, many good people in MPP and NDC, moderates who want to do a unity, who want to do, a, let us get a central agenda, etc. They are overwhelmed by the bad people. That situation has changed. In fact, the best thing a good person can do today is to stay out of politics and keep talking until the masses' mindset change because the only thing politicians fear are the masses. That's what we should be doing. That's why I commend this type of lecture. I don't believe good people should go into politics. And let me end on this note on that one. Nobody can convince me that MPP and NDC haven't had good men. There are two sitting in front of me, gone into politics. I know them personally. They are good. Have you changed anything? They have been overwhelmed. You have been overwhelmed. <laughs> Lastly, on the question of paper. Yes, I actually write papers and I publish a few. But when it comes to presentations like this, I disagree with the approach where a person comes to just read treaties and people don't relate to it. Yes, I'm converting this into a paper. And I know Prof will be asking me for that paper. <laughs> so, uh, uh, yes, they will, get a, they will get the paper and copies will be, I mean, uh, distributed. Yeah. 
Thank you. Please, um, where's my microphone? Bridget Jogbanuku, please. Thank you. Can I stand? Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, you want me to mount the stage? Why? Okay. I'm on the stage. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Okay. I like the camouflage with the mask, you see. Um, thank you very much. Uh, this is my first time hearing you in person, and uh, it's good to know that there are still a few righteous people in the land. Um, I liked your quote about the law. There's no law so good. I, I, I mixed it up, but there's no law so good as to keep an evil person from doing evil and all that. Um, you quoted, you mentioned a lot of places like Switzerland and um, Singapore and Rwanda. And I think the difference between them and us is our values. What are our values and what do we value in Ghana? We don't seem to have values. The things we value are wealth, so we can flaunt it, and acquisition of knowledge, not to apply, but also to flaunt the lettuce. So we are in pursuit of these two things, and with our chieftaincy, that is what is respected. So he's rich. Oh, have you seen his house? Have you seen the car he rides in and all that? Oh, he's knowledgeable. You go anywhere and they must... My friend Umaru here in an interview with him once during the election said, what is your profession? I don't have a profession. I sell oil, palm oil. But so it's... We, we value these things. But the true values that will make us like the Rwanda and the Switzerland and the, uh, um, what was it? Our discipline. There's no discipline. Right up to the top, there's no discipline. There's no responsibility. We are not responsible. It's not us. It's COVID. It's Ukraine. It's the other political party. It's never us. And I hate to bring the gender in here, but it started from Adam. It's the woman you put with me. So until, the, and these are some of them, discipline, responsibility, how committed are we to Ghana? We're not committed to Ghana, we are committed to ourselves. We are committed to how much we can make. And maybe if we stretch it, yes, to our political party, that is it. There's no commitment. Honesty, no. I have been told that you are too honest, nobody will vote for you. We don't have those values. And you say we are overtaxing, we are making people poorer because we have no love. I mean, it sounds very basic and very subjective, but we have no love and compassion for each other. We don't. And of course, that will bring in the inclusiveness. It's NDC or NPP, and if you're anything else, you're not going to be there. And in fact, in Ghana, it's a lot of male. If you're you a woman, uh, we'll see how we can bring you in. So we talk about the gender thing, but we don't actually practice it. So these are the things, our values. And until we, talk, we stop talking about, you know, the education, and I have a quote here which says, education without values, as useful as it seems, rather, uh, as useful as it is, seems rather to make a man a cleverer devil. And that is what we've done with our education, to make ourselves cleverer devils. Thank you. Thank you so much. Please give the microphone to him. Yeah. Yes. Take it by. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. My name is Patrick Akoli, the former chief executive of. Okay. My name is Patrick Akoli, the former chief executive of Goel. Uh. Um, uh, Mr. Dotti, you've done very well. But, uh, you know, among the, the three arms of, of government, you've labeled the legislature as a complete failure, or, or more or less. 
more or less. Uh, one of the things that have come up, all this says, is that the Constitution says the president must appoint at least 50 percent or more. I'm not a lawyer of uh, his ministers from parliament. So if you are in the majority side at any time, you want to catch the eye of the president because you may want to become a minister or a deputy minister. I personally think this is adding to the failure of parliament. And we've been talking about constitutional review at least since, uh, well, maybe 2010 or something, there was even a commission on it. Each year it comes up. Each year it comes up. And things are getting a little bit murkier. Because you, you are now saying we are in what? The constitution has landed us into what? Economic doom. When? <laughs> what is the time frame? <laughs> what are you waiting for? From doom to where? <laughs> when are we going to do that review? Well, maybe the experts like you will help us. Thank you so much. Yes. Okay, yes. Please take it to the middle rows. Hello. Um, my name is Safo. I, I don't have any big position. I was just a student of Mr. David. So my question is this. You touched on political parties and how theoretically we are supposed to gain value from the ideas they had. But for over a period, what I have realized is that there's no longer patriotism to the country, but rather patriotism to the political parties and how political parties can grow and further. So my question is, how does uh, Mr. David think that you can whip the country back into a position whereby political parties' rules are what we were supposed to get theoretically? That is providing us with ideals on how a country is supposed to go on rather than this duopoly we have gotten, which there is more of patriotism and loyalty to the political parties rather than to the country in which one belongs. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sorry, I'm told I have to move forward. Having a feedback when you're at this side, so um, thank you. Yeah. Manasseh, please come up. I see your hand is up. Is anyone else whose hand is up? Okay, just be on standby. Um, like, the, like the MPs who have spoken, I've been greatly enriched by this lecture. Um, and I find that almost everybody identifies the problem to one thing. You have introduced yourself. Maybe two. My name is Samson Ladi. I'm a lawyer. Now, Bridget just spoke about values. I've had the opportunity of hosting quite a good number of respected citizens who are quiet, who want to be in their quiet and don't want to be seen and be heard, at least. And they are worried about values. But the next thing is that you tie it to what Ms. Um, Ofusu Dote kept saying. If bad people want to do what they want to do, the Constitution will not stop them. So values first. And second, that leads to my question. We can't seem to measure incrementally what development we get from the duopoly. So at least on the national development planning, when the Constitution Review Commission recommended that it be made, its plans be made binding, is there a way to agree? And do you subscribe to that? It was drawing up a 40 or 40 years plus plan so that we can tell that if one government says, I want to do affordable housing, we know that we have done one set of affordable housing in 2020, we'll do the next this year, and we fit it into the plan. Not in a situation where, like we presently have. The best example to give is Seglime. We have how many houses sitting there, and they are rotting away. 
Recently, the media has been there and shown us the pictures. Almost 200 million US dollars sunk into a place for good purpose. We need about 100 million more, we are told, for on site and off site infrastructure. We can't do it. So it's sitting there and it's rotting. Is there a way by which the people can compel the leadership? At least the constitution in its preamble says the powers of government are to be exercised for the welfare of the people. The world is also coming to recognize, as we already preempted and have in Article 36, that the most secure democracy is one that provides the basic necessities of life as a fundamental duty. Is there a way to ensure this by the people? So if we can't rely on parliament and the executive continues to disappoint, they won't listen after they are voted. Is there a way out? Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Manasa. My name is Manasse Azura Wine. I work with the fourth estate. I would also want to add my voice to congratulate Mr. Fusuda Dorte for this wonderful lecture. I have two issues, and they are both coming from the Honorable MPs. The first one has to do with the statement that we get the leaders we deserve. I don't think it is accurate. I once said that I grew up in Kitekrachi, so if I dated a lady in Kitekrachi, there's no way this lady would ever ask me for pizza because you can't get pizza in Kitekrachi. So the average person in the village is that they don't know that to vote, you have to pay money to get it done. So there's a supply and demand side. The suppliers first came, set a standard, and that becomes the practice. I also have cause to believe that some of the countries we want to be like don't have very enlightened citizens. I was once in the US and were told that war was another way of teaching Americans geography. They are about some of the most ignorant people in the world, but they have very good leaders. The Singapore that we often cite, if anybody reads a Lee Kuan Yew's book, this was a broken system. There was no cohesion. This was a country that was falling apart when their colonial masters left. It took a leader to say that, look, we have to go this way. We have to get things right. And today it's a norm. So if we want to blame the citizens, then I think there's no need for leaders in the first place. The second issue has to do with uh, Honorable Ayane's statement that it is about the expenditure and not the collection. I think recently CDD and others commended Parliament on the work done on this current budget. And that alone shows that Parliament over the years has failed us. When a certain one of the taxes you mentioned, the sanitation levy was introduced, I went on Facebook and said, look, this is a tax that is going to be collected to fund a certain corrupt business. Okay, just last year, we at the fourth estate did a right to information request to the finance ministry to tell us what the sanitation levy has been used for. And all the disbursements went to that same company that I predicted. And I don't think parliament doesn't know this. Every parliamentarian belongs to an assembly. And you know that about 60% of the district assembly's common fund goes into sanitation. And there are as many as six or seven contracts in each of your assemblies that goes into sanitation. So if they bring another bill that go, we are taking this money to go in and fund sanitation, I think parliament should do better. And I agree with people who say parliament is one of the worst um, arms of government. I did a post, um, a survey on Facebook and the question was, is Parliament a useful or useless institution? About 80% thought Parliament was useless, and I don't think it has changed. Thank you. Thank you so much, Um
We'll just take two last questions. There's a lady there, and then Duncan, and then that should be it. Yeah, I think you can speak from the, um, while the microphone travels to Duncan. Let me just make a quick announcement. Someone lost their bunch of keys. It's here. It was left at the table at the front office. Uh, so there's a car. There's some car keys I have with me here. Kindly pick it up if it's yours. Also, Kwame Ampofo uh, of Okwampofo Foundation. You're needed outside immediately. Thank you, Duncan. Uh, thank you, Maru. Uh, thank you, David. And um, I had decided to keep quiet today, but sometimes <laughs> you just can't keep quiet. Um, as David did justice to the Constitution and uh, things in there that he thinks we can work at, um, we can all talk about the problems the country has, but at the base of all our challenges is the hypocrisy. We can decide to throw away our constitution today, import the American constitution or the Swiss constitution, and expect that that would help. Uh, it wouldn't help because we are hypocrites, unfortunately. When one party is in opposition, my office is a very fertile ground for them. They will come to me. Petrol prices are high. And for those who don't know your office, who are you? Um, the Chamber of Petroleum Consumers, Ghana. Um, we would speak for the rights of Ghanaians to a fair, uh, I mean, petroleum pricing regime and then the right quality also delivered. Uh, Senor Rana, we will bring him back. <laughs> yeah, it's good you're also sitting by the OMC chairman. It's fine. You know, um, when one is in... One is in opposition, the duopoly he mentions. They know all the solutions. And so you get courage, you get confidence that once, you know, power changes hands, whether they trick us or they lie to us blatantly, or they know that nothing will change, but they come to tell us differently. So they give you the assurance. Oh, when we come, this will be done. We can change this and fuel pricing. Uh, could at least be minimized to the minimum. They know where all the taxes, like David did, are coming from. You know, we are collecting taxes for sanitation and pollution. We collect taxes to develop the energy uh, infrastructure. Yet, you wouldn't see where the monies go because a certain finance minister with overbearing powers from the same constitution will decide what to do with the taxes that parliament has approved for specifics. We all look on hypocritically and allow them to have their way. Then when it blows up in our faces, we think that the Constitution is the problem. I think until we find a certain measure of restraint for our presidents or the executive, Ghana would never change with the Israeli Constitution, the Swiss Constitution, the American Constitution, or the unwritten UK Constitution. Until we find a way to restrain the overbearing executive such that the office of the president budget alone sometimes you wonder what they consume there okay and we have to pay for it thank you Duncan. thank, thank you, you so much thank you um, le let me now please bring the microphone so we're going to take the answers and then we can wrap up um let's give it to him yeah. thank you so much thank you that's <clears throat> quite a lot let me start from the last one uh, the issue of hypocrisy, I agree with you 100%, and I kind of alluded to that. Um, at times, I wonder whether, as a people, we have consciously stopped thinking. <laughs> I, I, I made that statement a lot, because it, it looks like what we are doing, we know is detrimental, but we keep doing it. And, and the best politician is the one in opposition. They, they, they know all the things. When they get there, they are not going to do the the right apology. You can't move to the next stage if the person didn't do anything at all. That's all we keep saying. So yes, you, you know, may not like it to a jump on, but what about Patrice? What about Operation Feed Yourself? I mean, there's no doubt that during his regime, yeah, housing. I mean, I look at Dansuman. You can pick the good things and do it. And the housing was, Dansuman was built by the military. At some point, it was the largest, uh, 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 what do you call it, uh, a real estate in West Africa. And just by the way, a lot of the DFIs we borrow from were actually not here. You remember his ENTR policy. It has this downside. 
But there are a lot of positive sides we can build on. So we need to instill the patriotism from different angles. And I believe uh, we will. Uh, Menace made comments. I, I don't, there's, there's, he didn't give uh, any question to me, except that on a lighter side, Menace reminded me of a, a friend of mine. He was talking about Kete uh, pizza. So there's a friend of mine who grew up uh, around the lobby and had no idea what pizza or sandwich was, club sandwich was. And he dated an Accra girl who then uh, asked for club sandwich. So I was in the house one Sunday morning. He comes to knock my door. I opened the door. He said, do you want to eat club sandwich? I'm like, ah, what's happening that you bring me a club sandwich? Apparently, he didn't know what club sandwich was. So he went to one of the hotels and ordered 10. When the girl had asked for just club sandwich and realized it was embarrassing carrying all this. So you have to distribute them and leave two to take to the lady. Anyway, but that's on the lighter side. Uh, Manasseh, thanks, thanks for reminding me about that. But on a more serious note, there's a question about the NDPC plan. What will it require to make the NDC uh, plan mandatory for all of us to uh, stick to it? The challenge is that the NDCP, NDPC plan itself is often not completed within one regime. And each party can, and they should tell us how they will implement the plan which is already there. Now, one way of judging them. Another way of judging them is to require the political parties to show in their manifesto how close their manifesto is, is to the existing one. In fact, there is the, Dr. K.Y. Amuakun is trying to work on that Ghana compact, which will create a central I mean, manifesto. One of the things I would recommend to Ghana, uh, uh, one Ghana movement, which and I, I think are doing excellent work, it's, it's an idea I've always had, to create what I call the the Ghana Common Manifesto, which is similar to what Dr. Kea Mwaku is doing. I and mean, you can come together, create a manifesto that you hand over to the two political parties and say this is a manifesto that, and we, we market the manifesto through the churches, the wherever, that we can manage manifesto. If we market it this year and everybody knows about it, it forces the political parties in creating their manifesto to benchmark the common one. So that's a recommendation I will make. Uh, on how we can achieve that. Then there is a question of, uh, okay, the development, that's the same thing I've talked about. Yes, there was this issue about uh, people not being part of the system and talking us from something like the uh, and talking about values, etc. I will answer that question, or it's not, it wasn't a question as such, I'll comment on that in my last comment uh, because I think it will address this issue. Because the issue of our values is relates to our culture, and it's a very, very big issue. Uh, let me give an example before. If you've been to a chief's house, uh, and Atacha is from a, a, a royal house, uh, if you've been to a chief's house uh, in any of the Akan areas, I don't come from an Akan area, but I come from a chief's house, even though I'm very f fairly averse to chieftaincy, I must, I must, I must make that point. You are talking to the chief, and the chief, let me say, speak, say it in three, and I will explain, that I in fear, come to me, a camera. In other words, in the chief's palace, what rules is might, not the law. That, and, and when a society has that culture, it's a very, very, very serious thing to deal with. Now, uh, uh, Bridget, you, just touching on that, the typical Guinean, I mean, in, in, I have examined this in a paper, which I wrote somewhere else on a different. What does a Ghanaian mean by the word leader? When a Ghanaian talks about leader, he doesn't mean somebody who can transform you from where you are to the next stage. No, he means somebody who is older, richer, a pastor, even somebody with my size of stomach. You, you, you can be seen as a leader just because you have a big stomach, right? So weight, weight has a positive effect, I mean, on, on becoming a leader. When you have a situation where people have that type of mindset, you need to do a lot of cultural education through center of civic education or the masters for people to change their mindset. So they follow politicians because they will give them the money, they will get the largest, the same way we follow, I mean, anything that. So we, 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 need, to, we need to deal uh, with that. Uh, Parliament, I, I don't think I said, if I said that, then, then let me change my way. I don't think I said Parliament is the... Is the Failure. I said they are the most disappointing. 
That's what I meant, at least. Okay, we were interpreting it for you. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, maybe, I think maybe, I, the, maybe the wish of the people that they ah, decide okay. put in your mouth. I think they are the most disappointing institution, actually. Uh, then there was this question about discipline. I think, again, we'll go back to the formula. Hopefully, when I say, circulate the paper, I talk about contemporary excuses we give to ourselves. Those excuses we give to ourselves to explain away our indiscipline. Look at all the excuses that every finance minister has given. It's always external forces. And as, um, as, as uh, uh, the, the speaker said, it's never us. It's always some external force. Uh, and we always have a way to justify it. 